You know how you said it's hard to see things clearly sometimes when you're too close? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been trying to get some perspective. I've been really trying. God's plan for me. I don't understand. I don't know why terrible things happen to us sometimes. But I have to believe that something good is going to come out. Anybody know where that's from? That's uh, Soul Surfer. Uh, the true story of Bethany Hamilton, professional surfer, lives in Kauai in the Hawaiian Islands, and she was out surfing one day, and a tiger shark bit off her left arm, the entire arm. And so it's, it's the story of, of Bethany. Uh, so here's, here's the quick poll, quick show of hands. Anybody here afraid of sharks? Yeah, come on, be honest. Anybody afraid of sharks? Yeah. And the truth is, the truth is uh, we have a lot of sharks in our lives that are uh, a lot more dangerous that we encounter a whole lot more in our day-to-day -day lives than we do in the ocean. You know what I'm talking about? I encountered a lot of them this week, and as a pastor, I get to see a lot of people swimming with a lot of sharks. And so I get a you know, phone call from Sandy Coy on Saturday, and bless Sandy and Jim's heart. Their daughter-in-law, right, daughter-in-law up north was uh, diagnosed with advanced uh, stage breast cancer. That's a shark. That's a shark. I visiting with Jan's grandson who was with us in worship several weeks ago, a 19-year-old uh, who is in, was in ICU and kidneys not functioning and paralysis of his right leg, and he's a construction worker, and that's a big deal. That's a shark, isn't it? And so I'm visiting this week with a guy in jail, and he's telling me a story, and the heartache and the homelessness and the brokenness in his family, and, you know, he has children, and man... That's a, that's a school of sharks. And I'm driving here from the house, and listen to this. Willoughby and Indian, dangerous intersection. Two cars totaled. Bam. You know, we see those sharks on the roadways, don't we? And uh, then Bob and Sue Green called me. I think it was Friday. All this is this week, by the way. And uh, Bob and Sue are members of the church. They go to the early service, and... Bob and Sue lost their 21-year-old granddaughter earlier this year to a car wreck. And Sue's 62-year-old brother, who was homeless, has always been transient and homeless, was just found dead. People are swimming with sharks. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? People in this room struggling with children and grandchildren who are autistic. People in this room who are struggling with addictions. People who are struggling with unemployment. People who are struggling with broken relationships, history of abuse or neglect with parents or others. People who are struggling with chronic pain, struggling with having had strokes, having had cancer. We swim with a lot of sharks. Are you with me? Now, here, here's what's really important to remember is that being people of faith does not make us immune to that. It never has. In fact, it's quite interesting that the people of faith have always swam with sharks. And they've always struggled. In the very beginning of our faith, in the very beginning of the Bible, the very people of faith that we grew out of, the people of Israel, it's embedded in the name Israel. Do you know what the word Israel or the name Israel means? It means to struggle or to wrestle. And, and, and as if that is not enough for us, we see this embodied in a story by a guy named Jacob. And uh, Jacob encounters God, sort of an angel, and he's wrestling. And in the middle of that wrestling, he gets wounded, but blessed, and renamed. His name is changed from Jacob to Israel. So, I want to share this story with you. It comes from Genesis chapter 32. Here's how it reads. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched 
as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked, what is your name? Jacob, he answered, and this is key. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Why? Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. Now, check this out. He's wounded and blessed both. We often think that it's one or the other. We need to find the blessing even as we're wounded. It's a real key for living our life in this story. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. We're talking about God and suffering, struggle. And it's true as we think about the whole history, the very name, the essence. You know, the church is called the New Israel, the New Strugglers. In the story of Jacob, who becomes Israel, in the story of your life and mine, here's the truth. Tell me if you don't agree. We see God, especially Jesus, most clearly in our pain. We see God, especially Jesus, most clearly in our suffering, in our loss, in our heartache, in our fatigue, in our confusion. Am I preaching to anybody today? You know, one one way that this is put, uh, Perry Noble, who's a pastor in South Carolina, he put it this way. He said, we worship God on the mountaintop, but we get to know God in the valley. We need this. We need this. This is where we get fed, where we get nurtured, where we give of ourselves. We encounter God. But guess what happens when you leave here, guys? You're swimming with a few sharks this afternoon or maybe tomorrow or maybe next Thursday at about 10.03. You don't know, do you? I had no idea my week last week would play out like it did. And boy, I was watching people swim with sharks, struggling left and right. The problem is in our faith life, we often think that we are supposed to stay on the mountaintop and we're disillusioned when we're not being blessed. Well, hello, Jacob, who became Israel, was both wounded and blessed at the same time. Why would we be so surprised? Remember the story where Peter and James and John, I mean, we're talking about the dream team here. They are up on the mountaintop with Jesus. It's a story called the transfiguration. It is sort of like a foretaste, a foreshadowing of what would only happen again after Jesus is resurrected. They get a little glimpse of this dazzling, amazing, glorified Jesus on a mountaintop. And they do what you and I would want to do. Hey, let's pitch tent. Let's make a camp. Let's stay here. Let's bask in it. This is what it's all about. But God had another plan. So here's how it reads from Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. He said to them, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before we see, they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. I mean, isn't that what we all want? I mean, perfect peace on a mountaintop with Jesus, and it gets even better. Check this out. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them also Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. All right, you're talking about the biggest hitters of the Bible. And so it's predictable, isn't it, that Peter would kind of respond the way he eventually would. Peter said, Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son I, whom I love. Listen to him. In other words, Peter, shut up. You're talking too much. There's a word in that for us, isn't there? Especially for me. Sometimes, you know, we think we know what this is all about. Who's in control of your faith, you or God? Shut up. Let God, least, let God speak. We need to listen. And so he gets Peter's attention. Suddenly they all looked around, the text says, and they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And here, out of all this amazing stuff going on, is what I think is the most important thing for you to hear. And you can skip over it if you're reading it on your own, but, but I want you to see this. As they were coming down the mountain, they came down the mountain, guys. 
Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. We want to stay on the top of the mountain. They wanted to stay on the top of the mountain, but Jesus had another plan. You know what was waiting for them when they came down the mountain? Three guesses, first two don't count. A lot of needy people. A lot of people swimming with sharks. A lot of people struggling. A lot of people wrestling. A lot of people in pain. And the very first person that came up to them, they just got to the bottom of the mountain. And this guy has a son who is struggling with what seems to be like epilepsy. He is having seizures. He's foaming at the mouth. They attribute that to evil spirits. All these crazy things going on. And bam, the sharks arrived. And Jesus, he knew. He knew that he couldn't stay up there because they were down there. Are you with me? Jesus will not leave us to be in bliss with a handful of blessed people on a mountaintop. He will always swim with us and the sharks of our lives. So don't you think about these two questions. As you think about those two images of Jesus on the mountaintop and what he was doing there and Jesus down below. Which experience illustrates the glory and the majesty of Jesus as well as the mercy and compassion of Jesus? Which one? Which story best illustrates the character and commitment of God as well as the power and love of God? I would dare say it's down low when he entered into the pain and he didn't stay away from it like Peter and James and John wanted to do, like you and I often want to do. That's so important for you and me. And that's why when we get to the 23rd Psalm, at very crucial points in our lives, that, that Psalm, and particularly the fourth verse, becomes so essential for us. Remember the fourth verse of the 23rd Psalm? Even though I walk through the darkest valley, or as the old King James says, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? You are with me. That is the most often stated promise in the Bible. You are with me. You're not going to stay removed on the mountaintop. You enter into my pain. You swim with the sharks alongside me. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yeah, it's so important for us to begin to grasp this. And here's what I want to, here's what I want to challenge you and me with. Here's a way of growing spiritually. You will grow, I promise you. You will grow spiritually when you stop being surprised by suffering and when you start finding God in the middle of suffering. Because that's exactly what Jesus came to show us, what he did. He wasn't gonna let Peter and James and John think, oh, up here, removed from all the people and all the pain and all the sharks and all the suffering, this is where it's at. No, 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 I'm going where they are and he does that for you and for me and so we're talking about the theme of God and suffering as a part of our questions for God series now I remind you and if you're new to us today we started this series gosh uh, beginning of summer and uh, they're collections of questions that you all wrote and they've been quite difficult by the way thank you um and, and so we have arranged these questions around different themes, and today it's God and suffering. And the three questions that came from you that we're addressing today are these. Number one, why does God let some people suffer so much and others so little? That is a big, hard, deep question. And then the second two questions are really kind of the same questions, but I went ahead and listed them. Here they are. Why does, why does a parent lose a child? And then thirdly, why does God allow children to suffer illness and die? All right, are you ready? Let's get to the first one. And in answering the first one, we're really going to get at the other two largely. Why does God let some people suffer so much and others so little? You know, so often we go around feeling like we have the lion's share of pain and suffering, and the target is on me and not others. And we have a very subjective way of viewing it. Maybe you're a lot like Hal. Hal is the deer in my favorite Far Side cartoon. Check this out. Isn't that good? Anybody ever feel like that? Yeah. It's you. You've got the target. But we're often unable to discern how other people are actually suffering. Now, as a pastor, 
and as a person, but especially as a pastor, I get to see a lot of suffering and a lot of the same stimuli that makes one person suffer and then the other person has the exact same thing happen, but they respond completely differently. I think there are a lot of variables, a lot of reasons why someone is more resilient in one situation than someone else in the same situation. And, and they'll, you know, it's all over the map. So we are really unable to assess, I think, how others suffer. And, 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 and we don't give that away very easily. We're not able to express that very easily. But there's something else in this question that I think is important to recognize, and that's an assumption. The assumption, and I say this, I know I'm, I know I'm walking on thin ice saying this. This is all very tentative, and I don't have all the answers. But I want to suggest this. The assumption behind this question is that suffering is always bad. Let me, let me illustrate this. Maybe you have seen an emperor moth before. Emperor moth is one of the largest moths in the species of moths. It's beautiful as moths go, if you like moths. Uh, large, large wings and pretty amazing so the emperor moth, much like a butterfly, it comes in, you know, of course, in the caterpillar form, and they have the chrysalis or the cocoon that they start off in before they become the moth with the wings. So this emperor moth one day is, is trying to emerge from this cocoon. It's a quite tight hole that it has to squeeze out from. And this, this guy is watching this happen. He sees this moth is, is not making any progress. This hole is too small. It's very difficult. And so he thinks he's being compassionate and merciful. He takes some scissors. And he begins to cut the opening of that cocoon ever so slightly to widen it so this moth can come out more easily, which it does. Its body still bloated and enlarged and its wings shriveled up. But what he didn't know was that it's designed that way. The moth has to squeeze through that opening. And in squeezing and struggling through that opening, it actually forces the fluid out of its body and into its wings. Only through the struggle can it grow wings and take flight. Are you with me? Do you see that sometimes what we interpret as a curse, as a wound, there's also a blessing in it. There's also a, bless, a purpose. We can come alive in a way and maybe God knows something we don't know because God's bigger than us. Maybe God knows that we need to swim with a few sharks in order to learn to swim a little bit faster. Maybe God knows that we need to see things differently. You know, when you're in pain and you suffer, you begin to see life differently. Maybe God knows that we need to come alive in a new way, a deeper way. Maybe God knows that we need to let go of control. Anybody like to be in control of their life around here? I do. Yeah, anybody, maybe God knows that we need to stop sweating the small stuff. And sometimes when we go through struggles, it puts things in perspective. Maybe God knows we need bigger wings to take flight. Maybe God knows something we don't know. That we need to be more fully who God created us to be. I, I can't fully explain all of it. You know, and I'm, I'm always looking for answers, of course, in Scripture and also in people's lives. I look, for instance, at... Someone who we, we all know is one of the most brilliant people alive, Stephen Hawking. Genius astrophysicist, Cambridge University professor who advanced Einstein's theory of relativity. He has ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, completely paralyzed, can't even breathe on his own, can't brush his teeth, can't talk. He is immobile and helpless. And yet... That brilliant person before he was sick, before he was diagnosed, described his life as a healthy person as being a pointless existence. And that's a quote. After ALS, this horrific disease, he began to see life differently, to live life differently with hope, with purpose, and to come alive as a brilliant, brilliant academic that he is. And he said this, and I quote, when one's expectations are reduced to zero, one really appreciates everything that one does have. I don't know. You tell me. Was Hawking better or worse for suffering ALS? Was that moth better or worse for struggling to get out of that cocoon? They're hard answers and hard questions. Let me give you three thoughts. 
and I think this gets at it a little more. And this is my perspective of what I'm seeing with this issue of suffering in our lives and, and what I see in Scripture and what I see in people's lives. And the first thought is this. There appears to be suffering that is redemptive. I see that scripturally and I see it in people's lives. And, and what I'm getting at with Stephen Hawking and, and with the moth is an example of that. By redemptive, what I mean is that because of the suffering, God brings newness, brings life, brings depth, brings meaning, purpose, zest, something that we need that we didn't know we need and that we couldn't have perhaps had without the struggle. Now, did God cause the struggle? I would not attribute that to God, but God definitely uses the struggle. And so sometimes I believe it appears that suffering can be redemptive. Now, I'm also, you know, I have my feet on the ground just like you guys. And I look at things that happen in people's lives and I shake my head and I just think, I can't find any good reason for it. And it appears to me, and this is the second thought, it appears that there is suffering that is senseless. Who can make sense of the Holocaust? Who can make sense of planes flying into skyscrapers and thousands of people dying? Who can make sense of mass famine and children and innocent people suffering and being victimized? We watched a movie the other night called Lion. Really recommend it to you. It's a story, true story of a, a guy who... Uh, who was rescued from, or escaped actually, uh, and rescued from India, from sex slave trade in India. And 80,000 a year, I think it was, was the statistic, children disappear that are kidnapped in India. I mean, who can make sense of that? It appears that suffering is often senseless. But I want to move to the third thought, and I really want us to focus on this, because I think this really gets at it. And I want you to look at this carefully. To protect our freedom to choose, God allowed us to choose the alternative to his painless world. And I want, I want you to just kind of sit with that for a minute. God loves you and me so much that he would rather protect our freedom to choose a world of suffering than make us robots who are immune from pain. Do you, do you follow that? It is born out of God's love for your freedom to choose. And the result, of course, is that we've chosen that and that there is great suffering and pain and death in this world. And God said, I didn't create you for that. I, I created you for a better way, for a better life, for something richer, deeper, more meaningful. And in fact, your collective choices, both in our individual lives and what we've inherited throughout history, have added up have built up to bring a whole lot of suffering and God is not to be blamed for so, so much of that. It's like a domino effect. One thing leads to another. We see that in family histories, don't we? We see it in whole nations and communities throughout the world. One thing cascades and suddenly, bam, we're feeling the weight of it all. Here's a way of illustrating this. And uh, well, first of all, I wanna share with the way Paul illustrates it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says it this way, I have the right to do anything. There's the freedom but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything. There's our freedom. But not everything is constructive. God gives us the rope, gives us the line. And we end up getting tied up in it, pounded by it. There's an interesting way of illustrating this. It was an actual encounter of a guy with an insurance company. And anybody like dealing with insurance companies? Isn't it fun? I think there's a special place in the pit of hell for insurance companies, personally. And this guy, no offense if anyone's ever worked with insurance companies. Um, but this guy, uh, he was uh, filling out an application for a claim and they needed more information. I'm gonna read to you exactly what he wrote. It says this, I'm writing in response to your request for additional information. In block three of the accident form, I put trying to do the job alone as the cause of my accident. You said in your letter that I should explain more fully and I trust that the following details will be sufficient. I am a bricklayer, he begins to describe. On the date of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I found that I had 500 pounds of brick left over. Rather than carrying the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley, which fortunately was attached to the side of the building on the sixth floor. 
securing the rope at the ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, loaded the bricks into it. Then I went back to the ground and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 500 pounds of bricks. Can you anticipate what's about to happen? He says, you will note in block 11 of the accident report that I weigh 135 pounds. In my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded up at a rather rapid rate up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This explains the fractured skull and the broken collarbone. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until my fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley. Fortunately, by this time, I regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of my pain. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel then weighed approximately 50 pounds. Yes, guess what's about to happen. I refer you again to my weight in block four. As you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity again of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up. This accounts for the two fractured ankles and the lacerations of my legs and my lower body area. The encounter with the barrel slowed me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell into the pile of bricks, and fortunately only three vertebrae were cracked. I am sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the bricks in pain, unable to stand, and watching the empty barrel six stories above me, I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. The empty barrel weighed more than the rope, so it came down on me and broke both my legs. I hope I have furnished all the information you have required. <laughs> Anybody ever feel like that? It's one thing after another, just cascading. It's a domino effect. That's, that's the experience we have when we swim with sharks in our lives. It's the experience that we've inherited often through families, through our culture, through our world, through history. The choices pile up, pile on, and we suffer. And God is not often to blame for that. Now, this kind of gets us to the second two questions, number two and three. Why does a parent lose a child and why does God allow children to suffer illness and die? We've already gotten at it largely, haven't we? Because children are not immune from God's love, great love to protect our freedom. And in that protection, we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable to a life that can go wrong where the bricks will fall on us and even the most innocent. And I can't ultimately understand it or explain it. One day we'll know. One day we'll know. I do know that God is not a malicious, and we talked about this last week with God's vengeance. God is not one who's up there pushing the smite button, as we said last week. And I do know this also, and this is important to remember, that God the Father, we talked about good, good Father, didn't we? We sang that. God the Father knows something about what it's like to lose a child, doesn't he? Not only that, through his life and his death, Jesus is in fact God's divine empathy in our suffering. And this is why it's so important to see Jesus in his, his humanity as God losing a child, but also in his divinity that he enters into our pain and into our suffering as God who suffers with us. This is God's commitment to us. He didn't stay on the mountaintop, guys. He went to the valley. He's in your valley. He's swimming with those sharks. You don't know what they are tomorrow, but he'll be there with you, whatever they are. He was there last time, whether you knew it or not. Are you with me? This is the big picture. This is, this is what God does. This is what Jesus is like. He chooses suffering for himself in order to bring us closer to him. Brendan Manning is one of my favorite authors. I've quoted him a lot in his book, Lion and Lamb, is just a fantastic book. And let me share with you just a snippet of what he says about this. He says, suffering love is God's strategy for overcoming evil. It is his only strategy. God saves through suffering. And he quotes Charles de Foucault, who said, not by his words or by his works, not even by his miracles, but by his cross. Why is the cross such a central symbol for Christians? It's not just a piece of jewelry. 
It represents that God suffered. And as God, he suffers with us. There is nothing that we go through that he has not gone through and that he does not go through with each and every single one of us. In other words, this is what happened. Jesus entered our world to suffer with us and to begin the ending of all our suffering. When Jesus came and he lived this life and he died on the cross and resurrected from the grave, he began the ending of all that plagues us, of all the wounds and the suffering and the sharks until one day it will be over. But in the meantime, he walks with us through that valley. In the meantime, he will never leave us or forsake us. And in the meantime, he's saying, I am bringing the very hope and the healing and the wholeness of heaven here and now to be with you in the middle of this. I'm coming down off the mountain to heal you. And Jesus began the inoculation. It's not finished, but he began the inoculation against suffering. He began the reversal of all that is evil. And that's why Paul can say these words in Romans chapter 8. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration. Anybody ever feel that way? Ah. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. That's God's goal for you and me. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what we already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. In this same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. You see, in our weakness, in our struggle, in our pain, God is still coming to us through the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? We do not know what we ought to pray for. You ever been there? I am so mad. I don't even know what to say to God. I, I'm so confused. I don't even know how to pray. I don't want to pray. Well, guess what? There's good news. Because it says it right here. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with gro wordless groans. God will even groan with you. Groaning is a prayer itself. And God joins in on it. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And here's a little promise to cling to. We know that all things, in all things, God works for the good for those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. You see, what I love about what Paul's saying is he's saying, you know, we struggle, we suffer. He uses these words. He uses suffering, frustration, bondage. You ever feel like you're in bondage to something? Maybe it's emotional, maybe it's physical. What are those sharks that you suffer from that frustrate you, that keep you in bondage? But listen, Jesus came not just to point to something in the hereafter, but to bring in the middle of our suffering and frustration and bondage the experience, another reality of God's glory, of God's hope, of God's liberation. We're wounded and blessed at the same time. Now it's up to you and me to choose to stay on the left side of that column or on the right side. We're gonna have suffering and frustration and bondage. That's a given. It's our choice whether we're going to accept and live in God's glory in the middle of the pain, in the middle of the wrestling match. Live in God's hope. Live in God's liberation. You see, Jesus, what he's done in his coming to earth, he infused this world with everything that's on the right side. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's why we're here on the mountaintop right now. So that when we go to the valley after we leave here, guess what? That goes with us. He goes with us. That hope, that promise. Jesus, in other words, is merging heaven and earth to redeem and restore us. Not just in the hereafter, but here and now. It begins now. He came off the mountaintop. You see, Paul knew what he was doing when he wrote this because in those days, the Jewish thought, in Jewish thought, they divided the world into two different ages. One was the present age and then the age to come. 
the present age and the age to come, which was thought of as the day of the Lord. This is when, all, when God will come back and everything will be right. The present age is bad. It's full of sin. It's full of suffering. It's not good. It's evil. It's decaying. It's death. He mentions all that in his letter. But in the age to come, in the day of the Lord, that will be Eden restored. When all is blissful, there will be no more death, no more decay, no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. It will be pure joy and peace and glory and goodness and freedom and love dwelling with God. The gospel in a nutshell is very simply that Jesus has already inaugurated the age to come. It's not another age set apart. It's here and now. He is bringing it. We pray for it in the Lord's Prayer. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. We're told to pray for that so that we experience it. We wake up to it. That's why Jesus says again and again, listen, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, read the gospels. It's here. It's among you. It's in you. It's near you. Again and again, he's saying, it's beginning. It's beginning. Here are a few verses from Matthew, chapter 3, verse 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not will be, but is. It's current. It's present. It's at hand. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. They're swimming with sharks. And what about them? Well, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's current. It's at hand. They can access it. Live in it. Matthew 10, verse 7. As you go, proclaim this message. For all people, the kingdom of heaven has come near. We have access to it. We can live in it. We can live by it. And so the, the spiritual challenge, you know what? We can't answer all the questions. And it's never going to be completely satisfactory on this side of eternity. But here's the spiritual challenge for you and for me today. As we leave encountering whatever sharks, wrestling with whatever angels are on the other side of our day, the spiritual challenge is to embrace the kingdom of heaven in your pain. To embrace the kingdom of heaven in your pain. The spiritual challenge is to trust. To trust that God walks with you in your valley whatever your valley is. The spiritual challenge is to find Jesus in your suffering by finding your suffering in Jesus. Do you see that? The spiritual challenge is to spread your wings and to take flight precisely because of the suffering, the sharks, the wrestling. The spiritual challenge is to live your life on the right side of the column in God's glory, in God's hope, in God's liberation. The spiritual challenge, my friends, is to live this day with confidence that it is, in fact, the day of the Lord. And can I get an amen? Let's pray together.